vision is the most important of the human senses. We learn to see only as we practice using the eyes. Simultaneously with the first visual impressions, infants reach for the object with their hands. Vision alone at this age does not give an idea of how far the object is away. Infants learn to judge distance in part by interpreting the stresses and strains of the eye muscles. The degree of convergence of the eyes helps in determining the distance of nearby objects. Familiarity with the size of an object helps in estimating distance when it is beyond reach. We learn to suppress vision when the eyes are in motion. Otherwise, we would have a blur like this, which would cause severe nerve strain. We learn to ignore motionless objects at the edge of the visual field. This helps to concentrate the attention upon the object on which our eyes are directly focused. Glaucoma, brain tumors, and inflammation may lead to a very limited field of vision like this. As we contemplate partial blindness and the blind, we realize more fully the importance of good vision. The brows afford adequate protection to the eyes themselves. The human eyes and the eyelids are things of great beauty and efficiency. The eyeballs are marvelous little cameras. They are globe-shaped and rotate in a socket. These two muscles control the up and down motion of the eyeball. Altogether, Six muscles control the motion and the position of the eye. The sun is the most important source of light, and it is by reflected light rays that objects in the environment are made visible through the eye. Light entering the eye passes through the cornea, the aqueous humor, the lens, the vitreous humor, and to the retina. The light perceptors in the retina connect with nerve fibers. These fibers merge into a cable called the optic nerve, which leaves the eye at the back. Through this same opening, blood vessels, arteries, and veins enter the eye to supply nourishment and to carry away waste materials from the retina. Here, the pulse is in the veins. The front layer of the retina contains millions of perceptor cells, rod cells, shown here in black, and cone cells, shown in white. It is these cells which transform light energy into another form of energy, which is transmitted by the optic nerves to the brain. The light from an object upon which we fix our gaze falls upon a small depression called the fovea, where there is a thinning out of the retina. Here, there are only cone perceptors, and each one has its own nerve fiber leading to the brain. These cone cells have to do mainly with sharp vision and color vision. Toward the periphery of the retina, the rods predominate. These perceive dim light and light from the side without color. When the light is dim, the pupil opens up so as to let in more light. And besides, the rod cells become more sensitive and thus take over the function which the cone cells perform under higher illumination. When we turn off these bright lights, we can see almost nothing. But within a short time, we are able to make out objects in the room. Our eyes have become adapted to the dim light. Vitamin A is necessary for good vision in dim light. The place in the retina where the nerve fibers gather and leave the retina is called the optic nerve. This area is blind because it has no rods or cones. 
We are not conscious of this blind spot because the blind spots of the two eyes do not correspond and are located in areas of less acute vision. The optic nerves, one from each eye, unite in the midline. Two new nerve tracts run towards the back. Each contains nerve fibers from both eyes. The optic fibers arrive at the primary sight center in the back part of the brain. In babies, the eyes turn in different directions until they learn to regard an object with both eyes working together. The image should always fall on the sensitive part of the retina. For distant vision, the eyes look straight ahead. But for near vision, the eyes turn in. If in looking to the side, the muscle of one eye fails to work, we are conscious of double vision. However, one of the images is dim because in one eye the rays are not focused on the fovea. Eventually, the dim image is suppressed and finally, this eye may lose its ability to see clearly. In some cases, the good eye may be bandaged so as to compel use of the suppressed eye and thereby restore sharp vision. The images from the two eyes are slightly different because each eye sees the object from a different position. But the brain fuses them into a single image. Many types of eye defects are caused by improper focusing of the image on the retina. Here, the players are out of focus, while the foreground spectators are in focus. This is nearsightedness, which results when the eyeball is too long from front to back. The focus is in front of the retina. This defect in vision may be corrected by wearing concave lenses. When the eye is too short, the image is formed back of the retina. This is farsightedness. By accommodating the lens, proper focus may be attained, but this stress may lead to discomfort that can be relieved by wearing glasses. An uneven surface in the cornea or in the lens leads to this type of distorted vision called astigmatism. Lenses can be ground to overcome this defect. Bacterial infection of the eye often comes from using public swimming pools, from rubbing the eyes with the fingers, and from using soiled towels. Infections may enter the lid and cause a sty. The mucous lining, the cornea, or even the interior of the eye may also be infected by way of the circulatory system. If a foreign particle becomes lodged on the eyeball, and especially on the cornea, it should be removed by a competent person. After applying a local anesthetic, this doctor carefully works the particle loose and then takes it out. Particles of steel like this may cause severe damage to the delicate membrane. Afterwards, the doctor washes the eye with a suitable antiseptic solution. Radiation from the red end of the spectrum, such as heat from the sun, may penetrate the eye and injure the lens, retina, or nerves and lead to permanent blindness. Ultraviolet light does not penetrate as far, but may cause injury to the cornea. In this situation of contrasting light, the eye is unable to adjust properly either for the bright page or the dark room. This type of eye fatigue is overcome by having uniform, good illumination in the entire visual field. The eyes need to be protected from all types of physical injury by suitable protectors. Because sight is our most precious sense, we should guard the eyes by proper lighting, proper food, 
and by preventing disease and injury to this delicate mechanism.